Um, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Ben Darnell, the uh, co-founder and CTO of Cockroach Labs. And uh, thanks, to everybody, for coming out for our, uh, our second, uh, second monthly San Francisco meetup. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, talking to you about uh, CockroachDB 1.0, which was just, uh, just released yesterday. Um, and I'll talk to you about uh, what's, uh, what all is included in, uh, in Cockroach 1.0, as well as uh, some, t tell you about, about some of the details of the development uh, that happened during our, our beta period over the, last, uh, over the last year or so. Um, and, uh, and also, I'll be, uh, I'll be talking about um, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the production use cases for uh, CockroachDB that, uh, that have been seen so far. Um, so first of all, just uh, an overview. Um, what, uh, what is CockroachDB? Well, we're a scalable, uh, scalable SQL database. Um, and so we provide a, uh, the best of both worlds between uh, NoSQL databases, which, uh, which provide uh, scalability um, at the expense of, uh, of transactional consistency and certain, uh, certain kinds of flexibility, and a, a traditional RDBMS, which gives you transactions and, uh, and consistency, uh, but is very difficult or expensive to scale up. And so, with Cockroach, you have a, uh, a very scalable system that can grow into uh, grow into any uh, any size and handle large uh, large amounts of data, um, and uh, providing high uh, high multi-active availability across uh, across all the machines in your cluster. Um, so, first of all, what what all do we mean by this? Uh, so, um, as a distributed SQL database, this means that we are a a distributed database that runs across many uh, many many physical machines. And, uh, but, and we provide, the interface to this is, is SQL, which is the standard uh, query language that uh, most other, uh, other traditional databases support. And so to your application, this looks as if uh, CockroachDB is just one giant, uh, one giant database uh, similar to uh, MySQL or Oracle or uh, Microsoft SQL Server or, or other, other databases. And so uh, this is a very, very compressed overview of what, uh, what our architecture looks like. Um, we have a uh, SQL layer at the top, um, which is uh, which uses the Postgres uh, network protocol. So you can use any um, any existing uh, network driver for uh, for whatever programming language you're using to talk to uh, talk to the Cockroach server, um, on, and that's that's built on top of a distributed transactional key value store. Um, this is actually a fairly common uh, pattern for databases. Um, most uh, most databases are built on top of a most SQL databases are built on top of a key value layer. For example, uh, my, MySQL has InnoDB, um, and then beneath uh, beneath the key value layer, we have a replication layer built on Raft, which provides uh, consensus and consistency across all of the uh, all the nodes. And so this means that whenever you write uh, whenever you write data to the database, it gets written to at least two uh, at least two of the three replicas of that data before it uh, before it uh, is considered committed. Um, and uh, secondly, um, we've uh, used uh, uh, kind of a new term here, multi-active availability. And so I'm going to uh, explain what this, uh, what this means by talking about the, uh, the development of availability in uh, database technologies. Um, originally, um, you would have uh, what uh, is sort of retroactively known as a low, avail low availability configuration, in which you have a, uh, a database living one, in one place, and then you would make a backup of it. And you might store that backup off-site. Um, so that if the if your primary data center were uh, were uh, out of commission, that you could bring your data back up from uh, from this backup. But this uh, this takes a long time, and so you know if this if you actually needed to use your backup, then you would uh, you'd be uh, out of luck for uh, for some time while uh, while that was being processed. Um, and so later on, um, you had the development of high availability. Um, but by later on, I mean like the 90s. So this is still uh, still a fairly old. Uh, Old idea here, but um, we, uh, you know, you have uh, multiple uh, multiple copies of your data in uh, in some sort of live replicated fashion. Um, in a lot of cases, that uh, with a, a SQL database, this was done in a um, in a primary secondary mode of operation, where you have one uh, one primary uh, replica serving all your all your traffic, and then you have a secondary replica that exists solely to be a uh, to, to be a spare for if something happens to the uh, to, to the primary. Um, you can also have uh, what's known as an active-active or master-master configuration, in which uh, each replica is uh, is actually serving traffic at the same time. Um, and the details of this vary by uh, by product, but in a lot of cases, this means uh, giving up on a certain amount of consistency. And so, in Cockroach, we have uh, what we call multi-active availability, which is an extension of the uh, of the active-active concept to uh, to do more than uh, more than two replicas. Um, 
And in Cockroach, it's a, it's a minimum of three because we are consensus-based, which means that every transaction is essentially like running a small election um, between the replicas of the, uh, of the data, and it needs to, you need to have a majority of the replicas participating to be able to commit anything. And so to be able to tolerate failures, you need, uh, you need three uh, replicas so that, the, uh, so that any two nodes can survive the loss of a third. Um, all right, so this uh, th this was a very uh, a very whirlwind tour of uh, of CockroachDB and its uh, and its basic capabilities. Um, before I go and uh, talk some more about uh, the process that got us from uh, from beta to 1.0, are there any any questions? Uh, yeah. It's okay. I'll, I'll repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, or was uh, the um, trying to put a SQL layer on top of a uh, key value store? Which one sort of came first? All right. So the question is, what uh, what aspect of this came uh, came first when we were uh, developing this uh, this database? I think um, the uh, the the first priority for us was uh, was I think uh, consistency. Um, I think that was the that was the, the piece that was really missing from uh, from existing uh, database solutions. Um, my two co-founders and I uh, worked uh, many years at, at Google, and so we saw um, the development of Spanner and its precursors there. And we saw that uh, in dealing with a NoSQL uh, database, you frequently had to uh, build up your indexes yourself, um, and that was very expensive in terms of engineering time to uh, to deal with that and. Um, you had to deal with uh, with uh, indexes slipping uh, slipping out of sync and partial failures and things like that, and so we found um, that that was that was really the key that uh, you need indexes to be uh, to be productive uh, with a, with a database and you need consistency for indexes to work the way you expect, and so that was the uh, that was the genesis of uh, of the Cockroach platform and everything else kind of kind of flows from there. So. You know, we, we didn't. SQL was not a critical uh, part of that. But once you're doing uh, once you're doing indexing, then SQL is kind of the standard way of of handling that. Uh, the question is: Is this a tip, the typical deployment of uh, multi-active with multiple instances in each locale? Um, so that is, um, yeah. If you have uh, if, if you have a database that is big enough to need uh, to need nine uh, nine servers, then you would typically place you know three here, three here, three here. Uh, you can do it with uh, with just one uh, one uh, server in each in each location, um, and that's presumably how most people would start out. Um, and then, but then as you uh, as you grow, it probably makes more sense to add more servers into your three existing locations before you expand into a fourth or fifth location. Thanks. How do you deal with like high latency um, between the DCs, and you need to write to two replicas, and they may be on the different DCs? Right. Uh, so the question is, how, how do we uh, deal with high latency between the data centers? Um, so that's uh, th that's an ongoing uh, ongoing area of development. I think that right now, um, at least for the for purposes of write latency, it's uh, it's important to not spread your uh, spread your replicas out too far over too much. Uh, Geographic area. Um, this is uh, this is an area that um, we, we would like to improve support for in the future, um, there, and this is always going to involve a uh, a read versus write trade off, because uh, having very widely distributed replicas is going to have a have a cost in terms of write latency, um, and that's just unavoidable speed of light kind of issues. Um, but by having replicas uh, spread around the world, um, as long as you can um, then serve read traffic from the, the nearby replica, then this could be a good way of reducing uh, read latency at the expense of writes. Uh, yeah, the, in, a, in a more typical environment, these would be, um, th these would be different, uh, different uh, availability zones in the same region, um, to use the uh, AWS terminology. So what's the optimal distance between the DCs? Uh, the optimal, what's the optimal distance between the DCs? Um, so for performance, uh, the closer the better. Um, for uh, disaster recovery, um, if you want to be able to survive a hurricane knocking out power to one of your data centers or something like that, then 
that, you know, that's going to uh, go, going to imply a certain amount of, uh, of distance between them. But that's, um, as, as far as performance goes, then of course the closer the better. Do you have any number in mind, like 100 mile, 10 mile, 50 mile? Uh, no, I don't. I don't have a. Uh, I don't have a specific uh, specific number in mind. But we're we 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 test our distributed clusters with latencies of, uh, you know, in the 20 to 40 millisecond uh, range, which is you know kind of half the, you know, half the distance across the U.S. So like you know East Coast and Central, and then a second East Coast location, something like that. Uh, so over the large distances, we can serve stale reads. Um, no, so, uh, not uh, not currently. So currently, each uh, each piece of data has a leader replica from which all reads are served. Um, in the future, this is what I was set, what I was getting to about uh, about wanting to support this better. In the future, you'll be able to serve uh, serve reads from uh, from the followers without having to um, go to the central leader. All right. So I'm going to uh, get back into the uh, presentation. We'll have more time for uh, questions at at the end. Um, so anyway, if you've been uh, if you've been following the development of Cockroach, um, you may know that we've uh, we've been in beta for a little over a year now. Um, we uh, our first beta release was in March of 2016, and uh, and then uh, the 1.0 release was yesterday. And so um, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what uh, what has happened between then and now, and how we went from our first uh, our first testing releases into uh, into today's uh, production ready version of uh, of Cockroach DB. And so this uh, this means working in uh, in a number of different areas. Um, first of all, of course, uh, stability is paramount. You've got to have uh, got to have the database uh, stay up as you're as you're using it. Um, performance needs to be uh, needs to be decent. Um, we're not going to uh, we're not going to win any uh, any benchmark trophies uh, with CockroachDB 1.0. But for a distributed SQL database, uh, we're pretty uh, we're pretty comfortable with uh, with where we are right now. Um, and then there's also some practical realities of, uh, of living in, uh, in or of, of deploying a database in production. Um, you need to be able to upgrade from one version to another without having to take everything down at once, and you need to be able to make uh, make backups of your of your data and restore those. And so these are th these are sort of the four big areas that we've uh, that we focused on over the over the last year. Um, in terms of stability, uh, we've been doing uh, what net the but Netflix has sort of coined the term uh, chaos monkey testing, um, in which we, uh, we start up a cluster and run, uh, run traffic against it, um, and then we randomly kill, uh, kill one or more nodes in the cluster. Um, and uh, when we started doing this, uh, of course, it started uncovering some, some issues for us. Um, this would usually mean that uh, whenever one node was killed by the chaos process, um, other nodes would then, uh, would then uh, fall over and die uh, shortly afterwards. Um, and so um, we've... We, we started uh, fixing uh, fixing stability bugs, um, introducing new ones along the way as we were doing parallel work on performance. Um, this uh, sort of reached a uh, re reached a critical point in August of last year when uh, when we decided that our stability really wasn't getting where we wanted it to be, and we declared a, a code yellow internally just to say that this was our our top priority um, to improve uh, improve the stability of the system. And we spent uh, spent a few months focused uh, almost solely on uh, on stability. Um, on the core team, and we've uh, we've written up a couple of blog posts about our experience with this, um, both uh, the beginning, uh, what got us into this state, and then how we how we got out of it. Um, but uh, in short, um, the the uh, the big uh, the big issue there, the reason it was always happening in conjunction with the chaos testing, was that uh, it was the, the culprit was a part of our uh, recovery process, in which after a failed node uh, after a node fails. Um, there's, a, there's a recovery process in which that node's data gets copied onto some of the surviving nodes, and that, uh, that could easily uh, cause nodes to run out of, uh, run out of memory. Um, now, um, now that with the uh, 1.0 version, um, we've tested with uh, up to uh, 64 node clusters and uh, expanded versions of our chaos tests and found that, uh, found that now Cockroach uh, is, uh, is stable under various sorts of, uh, of permutations like this. Um, so to, go, to give you a little more uh, concrete explanation of how, uh, how these stability problems arise, um, I'm going to show you what, uh, what happens when, uh, when the cluster uh, experiences a failure. So here um, we see that there's a, a four-node cluster with, the, uh, with three ranges on it which are approximately balanced. Um, this is you know, not, not perfectly balanced because node one has, has three, uh, three ranges on it, the others only have two, but that's as close as you can get with, uh, with, with these numbers. And so, if uh, 
if no no two dies, then we need to start a recovery process of the uh, of the ranges that were on that node. Um, and so you're going to copy uh, another copy of uh, of the red and the green ranges onto the onto the surviving ranges. Um, and here that's actually fairly straightforward because there's only two. But in a larger uh, in a larger example where there are hundreds or thousands of uh, of replicas per node, then you're actually copying a lot of data around. And what we saw was that um, the the repair uh, repair process on each node that's running independently would often all pick the same uh, the same target node for recovery, and so one node would just get hammered with uh, with dozens of uh, of ranges being copied onto it at once, and then it would run out of memory and die. And so basically, the the single biggest fix that we had for our stability problems was to uh, implement proper flow control and uh, and coordination for this, so that you don't see all of the uh, all the copies happening at once onto the same target node. Um, our second big uh, big area of development uh, during beta was performance. Um, the uh, the uh, in a in a SQL uh, in a distributed database rather you uh, you want to see that you can add uh, add new machines to the cluster and have uh, have performance uh, increase along with it. And so um, that's uh, that's our general our general goal is uh, is really s uh, scalability of performance rather than just raw performance numbers. Um, but in terms of the uh, in terms of the act, the, the like per per query uh, statistics, um, our current uh, our current performance is uh, is roughly um, within a factor of two of Postgres on uh, on simple queries. Um, on more complex queries, the uh, the results can be sort of all over the map. Um, and as I said earlier, um, write latency uh, depends very heavily on the network topology that you're working with and the amount of uh, of network latency between the uh, between the replicas um, of the of the database. And again, um, adding more adding more nodes to the cluster increases throughput as long as your queries are well distributed within the uh, within the key space. Um, and so this uh, this graph um, from our uh, our monitoring system um, shows that uh, that scalability of performance here. Um, it's uh, you probably can't can't actually read the numbers. Um, I'm not sure if the uh, if the contrast on these uh, on these graphs is even coming through very well um, out in the audience. But uh, anyway, there are three graphs here. The, uh, the first one is showing the number of nodes in the cluster, um, starting with a four node cluster on the left, growing up to a, a 64 node cluster on the right. Um, and then uh, in the middle, we have the number of replicas per node, um, where we see that the, uh, the number of replicas per node uh, divides, uh, get, gets divided evenly among all the replicas as the, uh, as the cluster grows. Um, you can also, if you look closely, you can see the, uh, see the sort of uh, ribbon pattern in, uh, in each of these uh, little transition phases where you can see the, uh, the, the actual ranges moving from one, uh, from one node to another and all the, all the numbers changing at slightly different times. And then the third graph is, uh, is the SQL QPS that's being served by this, uh, by this cluster. And you can see that it, uh, it actually scales up in, uh, in exactly the same pattern as the, uh, as the node count, showing that each of these, uh, each of these new... Uh, New nodes in the cluster is uh, is pulling its weight in terms of serving uh, serving additional traffic in the cluster. Um, the second, uh, yes, question. Uh, these were uh, these were single record uh, operations. Um, so so the the table being used here was uh, was just a, a simple key value table with no uh, with no secondary indexes, just uh, insert and in, inserts and lookups by uh, by a single primary key. Um, and in this case, it was that the primary keys were being chosen uh, uniformly at random. Um, so the second, uh, the second big area of, uh, of performance work that we did uh, during beta was our distributed SQL implementation. Um, this, uh, this was a big, uh, a big project. Um, took uh, took one, of our, one of our largest teams uh, the bulk of the, uh, of the last year to get this, uh, get this working. And... Uh, so, so uh, we originally implemented SQL in a fairly naive fashion in which uh, there was a single gateway node for every query that, would, that was responsible for executing the, the SQL logic, and it would actually just pull in all the data that it needed from all the nodes where the data lived. Um, this, uh, this, of course, is, is very inefficient. Um, it meant that, among other things, a, um, a query like select count star would actually be just as expensive as a full table scan because you actually were doing that full table scan to bring the uh, bring the records into the gateway node. Um, and so our new uh, distributed SQL engine is uh, is based on bringing the pushing the query down to the data instead of pulling the data back up to uh, to the query. 
Um, this lets us do uh, certain things, uh, especially uh, aggregation functions and uh, like sums and averages and uh, and joins um, closer to where the data lives, and so there's much less uh, much less data moving around into a into a central location. Um, and to show you uh, show you an example of a uh, of a, the sort of query that this helps, um, this is a query um, actually taken from the TPCH benchmark. Um, it's uh, select, uh, select ship mode and average of extended price from line item group by ship mode. So here this, uh, th this would find the, uh, find the average, the average uh, extended price. Um, I'm not sure what extended means in this context, but it's coming from, uh, from a standard uh, benchmark suite, um, grouped and aggregated by, uh, by the shipping mode, and then it, uh, it computes the average for that. And so we tested this on a, on a six node cluster and we found that uh, having the distri distributed SQL turned on um, made it uh, 5.6 times faster than it did with uh, than it was in, in the original. And so you're getting almost uh, almost linear speed up with the number of nodes that uh, that you're able to bring into the uh, bring into the query evaluation. Um, we have a uh, a visualization of uh, of the query planner that uh, is uh, is in development. Um, I don't think this uh, this is actually exposed in uh, in version 1.0. But this is uh, this is something that we use internally for uh, for, for uh, testing and uh, and evaluating the uh, distributed SQL engine. And uh, again, I'm sorry, it's not uh, may not be easy to uh, to read out there. But uh, just to give you an overview of what's uh, what's going on here, um, we have uh, the six nodes of the uh, of the cluster um, in these uh, six uh, six boxes. In the top of each node, we have a table reader, which is pulling the data from the uh, from the table, um, and then that goes into an aggregator. Which is uh, performing several functions on the on the data. Um, specifically, it uh, it does uh, it does some sums and counts of all the records as it as it flows through. Um, and then in the uh, in the tangle of crisscrossing arrows, that is uh, that's where the data is getting uh, that that's where the group by happens. The data are being uh, transmitted to other nodes based on what their shipping mode is, so that all the all the uh, statistics, the the sums that were computed in the first. Uh, Aggregation level uh, get passed to the uh, to, to uh, the nodes that, that are going to handle the uh, the second phase of the of the join or of the, of the aggregation, and then in the uh, and then below that you have a second uh, second level of aggregation which uh, does more more sums and then ultimately uh, does the division to compute the average of each of these uh, each of these operations, and so you can see here that nearly all of the of the work is being done on the in the first aggregator, that's the only time that the uh, that the entire query records are present, um, and so that that work is distributed across all six nodes. And then you have a uh, the aggregation phase, and then the uh, or the, the, the 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 hash uh, distribution phase, where it's uh, it's distributed across the cluster, and then everything is joined together. And these later stages only have to deal with a very small amount of data, proportional to the number of shipping modes, instead of proportional to the total amount of data. Um, so now for the uh, the third uh, third area of focus in the uh, in the beta period, uh, this was actually um, my uh, my biggest project personally in this uh, in this phase of development was uh, getting support for zero downtime upgrades. Um, so there's uh, there's several components that go into this, but uh, you know so, so ranging from the uh, the relatively simple like the fact that you need a a draining mode to allow traffic to, uh, to be drained from a server before, uh, before it actually shuts down and, uh, and interrupts whatever it was working on. And so we, we built this. It's triggered automatically by either a, a kill signal or, uh, or, or the cockroach quit command. Um, and then the, the trickier part of, uh, of supporting zero downtime upgrades is that during this upgrade process, you're actually running two different versions of the software side by side. And so that means that whenever you have two uh, two pieces of the system communicating with each other other over the network, you have to consider the possibility that that, that there may be two different uh, two different versions of the software involved. And this uh, this turned out to be very uh, very tricky for us because of the because of the key value architecture that we uh, that we had chosen and the way we were using consensus. Um, and so this uh, this was our original uh, key value uh, execution uh, pipeline. So you'd have the uh, the SQL layer at the top, which uh, Takes a, takes a SQL command like insert and turns it into a, a key value command like conditional put. Um, and then on one of the replicas, um, there is a leader for each, each range of data. And that leader is going to uh, propose the command. In the, this is the terminology used by the Raft consensus algorithm. So you propose the command, and then um, Raft is going to uh, propagate this, uh, this command to all of the followers. 
and then once a majority of the followers have the, uh, have the data, then Raft tells you that the command is committed. And so we would do this, and then after the commit, uh, Raft tells us that this, this conditional put command is committed, and so then each of, the, uh, each of the replicas would evaluate the command and apply it. But there's a big, a big problem with this if you're, uh, if you're going to do uh, version upgrades, because you may have um, a command that was proposed on one version of the, of the data, uh, or one version of the code, and then uh, evaluated and executed on another version. Um, or even uh, not just uh, the difference between proposal and, and execution, but also the, uh, the, the, uh, you may have one follower running a different version of the code than another follower. And so that um, could result in these, uh, in these replicas becoming inconsistent unless you're very, very careful to maintain uh, perfect consistency in the way these, uh, in, in the way these uh, commands are evaluated. And we found uh, during beta that it was uh, very difficult in practice for us to live within those constraints of never being able to make, uh, make significant changes to this, uh, this area of the code. And so, um, so, so the project here, um, we called it internally proposer evaluated KV because we want to move that, uh, move that evaluation step up to where the, uh, up to where the, uh, the leader actually proposes the command. And so here, um, uh, this, is the, this is the new version of the execution pipeline. We start by converting the, uh, converting the SQL command into a key value conditional put, uh, same as before. And then, um, but here, before we actually propose, uh, propose a command to Raft, we evaluate the, uh, the command first. And then what we're actually uh, proposing into Raft as the command that's going to get replicated is, uh, is actually a sort of pre-evaluated and serialized change to the key value database. And so then this goes into Raft, it comes back out as committed, and then we apply it to the, to the key value database. And so what this does is this uh, dramatically reduces the amount of surface area that we have to deal with underneath the, uh, the Raft layer, which is, uh, which is very difficult to change safely. And so this gives us a lot more flexibility to be able to um, expand and, uh, and change this, uh, this interface over time. Um, finally, um, our, uh, our last big, uh, big area of, uh, of development for, uh, for 1.0 is, uh, is building out uh, backup and restore. Uh, before, I, before I explain our uh, backup and restore strategy, I have to uh, back up and talk, uh, sorry, <laughs> I have to step back and, uh, and talk a little bit about uh, the Cockroach Labs uh, business model. Um, and uh, we're, uh, uh, so, so as, a part of, as a part of 1.0, we're also introducing uh, Cockroach DB Enterprise Edition, uh, which is going to live alongside uh, Cockroach DB Core. Um, which is the open source product that uh, that everyone has been uh, has been uh, using so far, and so the CockroachDB core is uh, is always going to be fully open source. It's uh, it's Apache licensed. Um, any functionality that's in core is going to stay in core. We're never going to like, close the door and move uh, move features that used to be free over to the enterprise edition. But the enterprise edition is going to uh, going to include um, additional um, additional functionality for uh, Large enterprise use cases, um, and so the first uh, the, the first uh, functionality that we're going to build in the enterprise license is our distributed uh, backup and restore system. Um, future uh, future work that we're planning to have in the in the enterprise uh, model is uh, our geo partitioning feature, um, which is going to give you better fine grained control at the row level of where uh, where your data lives in a in a geographically distributed cluster. And so this is uh, th this is a, a dual licensing model. Um, and the enterprise edition um, in something that uh, we think is, is fairly, uh, fairly unusual for this kind of software is that the enterprise license is actually um, uh, very, very liberal and very similar to an open source license in a number of respects um, in that you can, uh, you can see the source, it all lives in one repo, you can make, uh, make your own derivative works um, if, you, if you need to, uh, but, uh, but you but the, the only restriction is that if you use any of the features that are covered by the uh, by the enterprise license, then you have to pay uh, pay Cockroach Labs for that uh, for that license. Um, and uh, if you're interested in uh, in the business uh, behind this uh, or licensing terms, anything like that, you can come uh, come talk to us afterwards. Um, so as far as uh, as far as backup and restore go, um, this means we need two separate uh, two, two, two separate solutions for uh, for backup. And so we have a uh, in the core product, we have a cockroach dump command, um, which is similar to uh, PG dump or MySQL dump. It just runs over the database and produces a, a SQL file of insert statements that will recreate that database. Um, 
And so this, uh, th this will work just fine up to, uh, up to a certain scale. Um, but uh, at, at larger scale, um, it's going to, be, uh, going to be very slow. You need, uh, you need one, uh, one machine that is uh, able to handle the, uh, the entire database and to give you, a, uh, give you a place to actually store your backup, which, uh, which can be difficult in a, in a larger database. And so once you're, uh, once you're dealing with, uh, with enough data, then you're, uh, you're, you're going to want the uh, our enterprise uh, backup and restore, which is a distributed uh, parallel and incremental uh, backup implementation which also supports backing up to S3 and other, uh, other cloud-style storage, uh, storage systems. And so this is the, uh, th these are the two, uh, th the two options that we have for, uh, for backup. Um, and it's, it's our intention that, uh, that the, the, free, uh, the free dump uh, backup will, uh, will be sufficient for, uh, for uh, a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller, uh, smaller use cases. We're not trying to uh, cripple it and force you to have, uh, for have an enterprise license to be able to backup at all. But uh, but we think that this is uh, that this is sort of the uh, the dividing line between a uh, a serious uh, a serious business uh, use case where you can you can and probably should be paying for the software you're using versus the uh, the more open source kind of hobbyist uh, early stage startup uh, use case. Um, finally, um, uh, now that uh, now that we're in uh, in 1.0 and uh, and telling you that uh, the cockroach is ready to uh, to be used in uh, in your production applications, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about a couple of uh, of people who are already uh, already using cockroach in production. Um, first one is uh, is Heroic Labs. Um, they, they make uh, they make back end software for for mobile games, um, and they're they're kind of an interesting uh, interesting use case. Their big attraction to cockroach DB is actually not our Consistency or scalability or anything like that, but they're they're interested in Cockroach for its uh, its ease of deployment because they uh, that they make uh, that they make server software which they then sell to uh, to game studios to be deployed on those uh, on those game studios uh, hardware, and so they want a database that they can ship with their own uh, with their own software and um, and have it have it live alongside their their software and be fairly easy to manage. And so they so they chose uh, Cockroach DB for that for that purpose. And so if you uh, if you <clears throat> if you download their uh, their software, it's called uh, Nakama, um, and install that, then you get a Cockroach DB installation right alongside it. And then that's where uh, where uh, the Nakama software stores its uh, stores its data. Um, so this is this is kind of an interesting uh, interesting use case. It's not one that I would have uh, expected at the at the start would be one of our uh, one of our first production use cases, but uh, they. Uh, they came along and uh, and found us and were very uh, very eager early adopters and providing very uh, very helpful feedback early on in our uh, in our development process. Um, our second uh, second production use case um, is uh, Baidu, the Chinese search engine. Um, they're using a, using Cockroach for a part of their uh, knowledge graph product, um, which is where they store uh, structured data extracted from web pages to include in uh, in search results. Um, and so they're storing a part of that data in Cockroach now. Um, and they're uh, looking, uh, I believe, to eventually migrate the, that uh, that entire product over. Um, also considering us for uh, for some other uh, other applications as well. Um, and so this is uh, this is much more of the typical uh, deployment use case that uh, that we were expecting for Cockroach, um, in that it's a uh, it's a large, uh, you know, they've got multiple large data centers where they're uh, running uh, running the the service. Um, in this case, all in in China, so not uh, not very. Uh, far geographically distributed, but uh, but still uh, with multiple uh, multiple points of presence and uh, and replication. Um, so uh, that um, like to um, encourage uh, encourage anyone who is uh, who's interested to uh, to give uh, Cockroach uh, Cockroach DB a try um, in your uh, in your application, whether that's uh, in uh, just in development or in or in production. Um, you can uh, you can help us make uh, make cockroach better by uh, by trying it out and giving us feedback. Um, all the uh, all the details about how to do this are at cockroachlabs.com. Um, I also want to mention that uh, we are hiring, um, primarily in New York. So uh, not uh, uh, so, so it's it's going to be uh, going to be best if uh, if you're open to uh, open to relocation if you're uh, if you're interested in that. Um, but uh, we do we do have some some remote uh, remote employees as well. So if you're uh, if you're interested in uh, in databases. Uh, in general, do uh, do let us know. Um, you can go to cockroachlabs.com slash careers to see the uh, see the positions that we have available. And uh, with that, I'll uh, open it up to questions.
Yeah, uh, so during the beta, there was one release that required a stop the world update. Yes. And the reasoning given for that was that the on-disk format of some piece of data was changing. That doesn't seem like the type of issue that would be solved by the proposer evaluated KV store. So if on-disk formats change, is that still going to require a stop the world update in the future? Right, so, uh, so the question is because we had, a, we had a, uh, at least one, uh, one release in the beta period uh, where we changed the on-disk format of a particular data type and, uh, and needed to do a, uh, do a stop the world upgrade. Um, you're right that this uh, this particular instance would not have been uh, would not have been fixed by the uh, by the proposer eva evaluated KV uh, feature that I was talking about. Um, I think that there, there are um, yeah there, there there are going to be things that are not covered by this, and um, in that in those cases um, during the beta process we were um, kind of taking taking some shortcuts that we will not be taking in the future. Like the, the in that case, we we required to stop the world upgrade because it would have been uh, it it would have been uh, too uh, too expensive in development time to uh, to actually build a proper migration solution for it, but the like, migration would have been possible and um, and so yeah go, going forward uh, post 1.0 um, whenever we need to do something like that we'll we'll do the work to actually make it a uh, make it a seamless migration. Um, I think a a more likely scenario um, that. Uh, that, that has come up uh, more recently in the in the later uh, later stage beta periods. Um, there have been some times where we uh, where we've changed an index format, for example, and both for the old and the new formats are still supported. But uh, you'll get better performance if you drop your index and recreate it in the new format. Um, that is uh, that that's more representative of the kinds of uh, of upgrade disruption that you might see in the future, where things will uh, will keep working, but if you if you can uh, go through this uh, go through this extra process, then you might be able to get uh, get get performance benefits by switching over to the new version. Cool. Uh, speaking of migrations, a uh, different type of migration. I know that uh, a lot of focus has been given to get ORM support off the ground. Mm -hmm. um, has there been any work on uh, migration libraries like Flyway or maybe an, an internal solution? Uh, yeah. So Flyway is uh, is high on our list for uh, for version one point one. Um, and uh, yeah, the, the, the tricky part there is that all of these uh, migration libraries, uh, they end up having very database specific ways of looking at the, uh, looking at the database, finding out what tables exist and what their, uh, what their schemas are. Um, the migration libraries have turned out to be the, uh, the, the trickiest, uh, trickiest things in that respect to get, to, to get uh, compatibility with because they really uh, exploit every, uh, every implementation detail they can about uh, about the Postgres uh, introspection interfaces, um, and so that's that's why those didn't uh, didn't quite make the cut for uh, for 1.0. But uh, we want to support that either by either by becoming uh, more compatible with Postgres so that they can just work, or by providing our own our own dialect plugin that will uh, that will work with uh, with Cockroach. But uh, yeah, we're we're definitely looking at uh, at Flyway. That's one of our top uh, top requested features, um, and uh, we we may consider similar. Uh, other similar tools um, as, as demand uh, reveals itself. So on that topic, um, wh what is the breadth of compatibility with PostgreSQL, Postgres libraries and drivers and um, things like GCP or um, kid shows and products like that? Yeah, so our compatibility with Postgres is, um, it, it's generally pretty good, but um, again, there are a lot of, these these more complex frameworks end up uh, looking into a lot of edge cases um, in the uh, in the databases, and so they don't uh, they don't always work uh, they don't always work out of the box. Um, we have uh, we have a pretty good uh, pretty good breadth of support, um, so that a lot of uh, your, your simpler uh, simpler uh, frameworks um, kind of the, the database access uh, systems that uh, that don't call themselves ORMs. Um, tend to work a little better if the, if it calls itself an ORM, then it's it, it's usually a little higher up the stack and a little trickier to work with. Um, and so we have um, we, we have a handful of uh, of ORMs that we actually publish uh, custom uh, dialect plugins for, like a Hibernate, uh, SQL Alchemy, in the Python world, uh, SQLize for Node.js, um, and uh, Active Record for uh, for Ruby. And so we have we have specific support for uh, for a few of these. Um, for others, um, you, know, you, know, you can give it uh, give it a try, see uh, see if it works. Um, the compatibility is, uh, like I said, it's it's good but not perfect. Um, it's uh, um, in terms of just talking to people here today, um, the features that we uh, that we don't have that 
uh, that, that people have asked me about today are, uh, are triggers and stored procedures. So if you're if you're relying on uh, on anything like, like that, then we uh, then we don't have it. If you're doing just more basic uh, more basic CRUD operations, um, our compatibility there is uh, is pretty good. But all the kind of Postgres specific introspections and system tables exist in Postgres as well. Uh, yeah. So we have uh, we have both the standard information schema tables and the uh, the Postgres specific PG catalog tables. Um, but uh, like we've found that our PG catalog tables are not uh, not perfectly compatible with Postgres's, and that's where uh, that's where a lot of the uh, issues crop up. Um, one other question while I have the mic is: Do you have production users in the Bay Area that you can point to? Uh, do we have production users in the in the Bay Area? Um, I know we have users in the Bay Area who are close to production. Um, I don't uh, I, I don't think we have anyone in the uh, in the Bay Area uh, that I that I have permission to to talk about publicly at this point. I saw in your uh, 0 0.1 blog post yesterday you talked about zero downtime migrations. I sh is that talking about, were you talking about structure migrations or like upgrades? Uh, so in, in the blog post yesterday we were talking about uh, the, uh, the zero downtime upgrades like I was just uh, talking about in this presentation. But in terms of your database migrations, um, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's an important feature of Cockroach that I, I didn't touch on in this, uh, in this presentation. But our schema changes, our alter table statements, and and that sort of thing are non-blocking, um, and so they don't uh, they don't lock up the entire table while the migration is being run. So you can do this. Um, it currently has uh, has a bit of a performance impact on other queries, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't just lock the uh, lock the table for the entire duration. Okay, cool. That's what I wanted to ask. Uh, so sorry if this is already covered in the release docs, but does uh, 1.0 support um, row level locking or, or table locking? Uh, so in terms of locking, um, we don't support uh, we, we don't support explicit uh, explicit locking in the database. Um, we lock uh, well we, we use a our transaction model is is kind of difficult to explain here. It's sort of a hybrid of an optimistic uh, concurrency model where uh, where you need to um, abort and restart instead of uh, instead of waiting. Um, there are times where we do uh, we, we do wait and uh, and queue up transactions instead of aborting them and restarting, um, and that all that happens at the uh, at the row level. Um, we, we don't give you um, advisory locks or explicit lock uh, lock commands like some like some databases do. Um, so. Uh, not the the, the, the the suggestion to use a unique constraint as a as a lock. Uh, not not exactly um, because of the because of the uh, the optimistic aspects of our transaction model means that a transaction can be aborted at any time, and so that means your lock can be taken out from under you, um, which is not uh, not not going to be compat. Like it's it's enough to give you uh, serializable transaction semantics. But it's not enough for you to use a row in a table as a lock, um, in the same way that you could uh, you could do in other databases. Yes, uh, that's a two-part question. Oh, there you go. Can you hear me? Um, so I think does each cluster keep a full copy of the data set? And then also, how do you? In the beginning, you said the main focus was consistency. So if someone writes to cluster A and someone writes to cluster B at the same time, how do you handle that? Um, yeah, so first of all, um, for the, uh, the terminology, so um, in, in something like, uh, like this diagram, um, we, we would consider all of this together to be one cluster. Um, and then you have three, three data centers, um, each of which has uh, three nodes in it. Um, yeah, so, and then the, uh, the way the, the, the key value layer works is the data is partitioned into contiguous ranges which are then uh, distributed across different uh, uh, di different replicas, and so in this case, each uh, e each of the little cylinders here would have a copy of one third of your data. So you'd have in, in DC in DC one you'd have a third, a third, a third, and in DC two you'd have a third, a third, a third, and, and so on. So uh, you'd have an overall replication factor of three here. Does that, does that answer the question? 
second part, if someone writes to one cluster and another person writes to the second cluster at the same time, and it's going to be highly consistent, how do you handle that? How do you handle conflicts? Right. So uh, if someone's uh, if someone's writing to the same uh, the same record in multiple data centers, then that's that's where the uh, the consistent consensus protocol comes in, because there's only going to be one uh, one leader of uh, of each range, and then um, that uh, that leader is going to uh, going to go through the consensus algorithm to make sure that it uh, that, that a majority of the nodes in, of the replicas of that of that piece of data agree on the uh, on the command uh, what yeah what, what happens to the loser so uh, then that uh, that that returns an error um, up to uh, up to the higher levels um, and that uh, may depending on the depending on the, the type of conflict it may or may not be uh, Retried automatically within the system, or it may be uh, it may be kicked out to the uh, to the client as uh, as a failed transaction. Okay, so I'd be interested in some numbers in terms of what's your largest deployment, how long have you been running it, how many nodes, how much data, how many hosts, um, how long does it take to restore, um, incremental, all that stuff. Um, let's see. I don't uh, I don't have a lot of those numbers off the uh, off the top of my head. Um, I think that um, let's see the ones that I the ones that I can uh, can give you are um, we have uh, uh, we, we we've done we've done almost all of our we've done some testing with up to uh, with up to 100 nodes, um, but most of our testing has been uh, focused on uh, 64 nodes as the as the largest uh, largest cluster. Um, I don't know off the top of my head how big um, like Baidu I think has our largest. Uh, our largest uh, customer cluster, but I'm not sure exactly how uh, how big it is. Um, and uh, we've done. Uh, I, I should know how long it takes to uh, to do a uh, to do a restore, but I can't. Uh, I, I don't. I don't have that number off the off the top of my head. Um, so, so I think you, I think we, we have a uh, we have a GitHub repo where we have some benchmarking tools. Um, we don't have uh, benchmarking num numbers that we published yet. Uh, we're working on that and hope to hope to get that uh, get that published soon. Yep. Um, so you you said that as long as um, sorry, uh, your queries are relatively simple, um, your performance can sort of scale linearly. Uh, do you have any plans for building tooling around? Helping users detect which queries aren't well distributed. Um, yeah, so we have uh, we have uh, some some tools for that. Like we have the we have an explain command um, similar to other databases to let you see um, see how well your queries are able to uh, able to utilize your indexes. Um, we don't have any uh, the, the the big the big factor for uh, for performance is actually not how your queries are structured but structured but how your uh, your key access patterns are, um, and so that is uh, that. That's not something that uh, we have any any definite plans for, but uh, that, that would be a, that would be a good uh, good idea. Can I ask a question too? In terms of terminology, right here you said this is one cluster. Yep. And how many nodes do you consider this? Uh, this is uh, one uh, one cluster with nine nodes. Um, and then the, the squares are the uh, are, are the client applications, which are not a part of Cockroach. Question on the, um, do you, is it possible to store JSONs as well? And is there like a dynamic flexibility on the schema with the key value store? Uh, no, we don't. Uh, we don't have any any support for JSON or array uh, columns yet. Um, we're working on uh, on at least array columns uh, very soon, um, and JSON will probably be uh, shortly after that. But uh, we don't, uh, but we don't support that yet. We don't, and uh, so, so it's uh, it's all like a fixed, uh, so. fixed schema. Uh, yep. What about what about service discovery? If you wanted to have these nodes exist in an auto scaling group, how do they discover and self assemble? What kind of primitives do you guys employ to make that happen? So. Do you explicitly have to join manually, or? Uh, yeah. So the so the way you the way you start a cockroach cluster is by um, is by starting starting the node. You give each node a uh, a TLS certificate and uh, and the address of at least one other node in the cluster, um, and so that 
And then for your client applications, of course, you need some sort of uh, discovery mechanism there. And that's going to be kind of deployment uh, specific. We have, some, uh, we have some sample configurations for uh, doing this with Kubernetes, for example. Um, and we want to uh, expand that to include, uh, include more environments. But, um, but mostly uh, the service discovery part is left to the world outside of Cockroach itself. Um, in the diagram where you explain the way that ranges are redistributed if a node fails, yep. um, those distinctions between ranges, is that within a single table or um, is it possible that one instance might end up collecting a lot of data related to one specific table? Uh, yeah, so a, a range is, uh, is any contiguous chunk of the key space. Um, and so a tape, so, so all the data, so each table is broken up into multiple ranges, um, and a node might uh, might contain a mix of data from different uh, from different ranges. Um, so, obviously, you're announcing today that Cockroach is ready for production use, um, but you d you said you didn't have any published benchmarks yet. Right. Um, I guess just to get a sense, let's say hypothetically. Um, I had a reasonably sized PostgreSQL, Postgres cluster serving CMS and um, some logging into that, or a you know, reasonably high volume um, website that served across multiple regions, and I wanted to switch, consider switching over to Cockroach. What kind of performance advantage or disadvantage would I likely see right now? So um, if you're if you're serving in a uh, in a single node uh, Postgres uh, Postgres instance right now, um, then uh, yeah, you know, like I like I said, we're we're within we're within a factor of two on Postgres performance in uh, in uh, in simple queries at least. And so if you're if you're if you're taxing your uh, your Postgres instance now, then that would uh, that that would suggest that you would need at least a six node uh, cockroach cluster um, to to match that. Um, and uh, as far as what the uh, what the performance would look like, I think that's. Um, I mean, there's there's no substitute for you know actually testing with your own uh, your own schema and applications. Um, I mean, so soon we'll have uh, we'll have um, some benchmarks that we can uh, we can publish and share. We just want to make sure that we're uh, you know getting uh, get, getting everything in order in order for that before we uh, before we talk about it publicly. Um, so I have uh, one more um, announcement uh, here uh, about uh, using Cockroach with Kubernetes. We're actually uh, in a month, uh, in next month's meetup uh, in uh, on uh, June fifteenth. Uh, that'll be uh, taking place at uh, at Cloudflare, and that's uh, specifically we're going to be talking about using uh, Cockroach DB with uh, with Kubernetes. So if you're interested in that, you can uh, sign up for uh, for next month's uh, meetup. Uh, yeah. Um, so you talked about. Um basically pushing the queries to the data. Mm -hmm. And I'd be interested in how you cluster the data because um, like, do you dynamically create some indices um, based on the types of queries that come in to optimize it? Do you sort of reshuffle the data? How do you choose where the data goes? Yeah, we're, 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 not, we're not doing anything like that yet. Right now it's just, uh, just fairly naive load balancing. We're not, uh, not taking into consideration clustering or anything like that at this point. How much tuning do you need to do to have a higher performance? How much tooling? Tuning. T tuning. Um, uh, I mean, I'm not sure how to uh, how to quantify that. I mean, I think like with any uh, with any relational uh, database, you need to um, get, you know have the you know run explain on your queries and uh, and look at the look at the query plan, think about your schema and indexes and uh, and things like that. We don't have a lot of other knobs that you can tune. Um, you know, there's a handful of knobs like how much uh, how much memory to dedicate to caching and and things like that. But um, at, at this point, we don't have. Um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, of tuning that you do aside from uh, from designing your uh, your schema and your and your queries. Uh, how much fund do you have raised, and when you are thinking of going for the next round? Um, I'm sorry. How much fund you have raised, and when you are thinking to going for the next round? Uh, so, uh, so just uh, just yesterday, we, we announced that we've raised our uh, raised a uh, 27, uh, 27 million dollar uh, Series B. So, so um, 
most of the examples uh, that I see of clusters show uh, 3x replication. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you have any sense of what the performance impact is, other than clearly using more storage of a uh, higher replication factor. So I think Spanner generally uses 5x. Uh, yeah, so 5x replication versus uh, versus 3x. Um, that, yeah, there's obviously more storage uses, use. Um, less obviously, there's more um, more disk I/O being done, um, and so we find that uh, you know running with a higher replication factor uh, drops your uh, drops your write uh, performance by about forty percent um, compared to to three x um, for for that reason. Um, other than that, um, there's that, that there are, there are potentially more more subtle effects that uh, we'd love to spend more time uh, exploring and uh, and. Uh, quantifying, but you can uh, you can imagine that in a uh, in a five node uh, in a five node replication group, you can um, you can then commit with uh, with any three, and so you can you know being able to survive more failures, but also being able to survive more like slowness and anomalies. That might that would presumably help to smooth out your uh, your latency in comparison to a three way uh, replication uh, replication factor. Um, but uh, we don't uh, we, we don't have uh, a lot of experience running in that uh, in that mode yet. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, yeah, I noticed in one of your slides that you mentioned um, a future, maybe an item on the roadmap might be to be able to distribute data geographically. Yep. I just wanted to understand if the use case for that is coming more from uh, an availability perspective or more from a data sovereignty and governance perspective. So uh, taking into consideration European data storage laws and things like that. Uh, yeah, that's that's uh, absolutely one of uh, one of the motivations for this feature is uh, is data sovereignty and uh, um, and also uh, read latency. Um, it, once we uh, once you have the ability to uh, perform reads from uh, from followers as well, so that then you can have a, a local uh, local source for reads. So th th those are the two uh, th the two motivations there. On. If I have like uh, a setup with a Postgres and Elasticsearch to speed up like full text search, would this be like replacing Cockroach and Postgres um, and still using Elasticsearch to prefer setup, or would you replace both? Um, so, so at this point, uh, we can only only really replace Postgres. Uh, we don't uh, we, we don't have support for uh, for full text indexing. Um, or you know we we don't really have the the primitives to build uh, build full text indexing into, into the database yet. Um, it's something that we would uh, we we would like to grow into at some point, but uh, but but for now we would only replace the Postgres part of that uh, of that deployment. Thanks. Uh, I have two security questions. I first uh, do you support our standard Postgres authentication. Uh, yeah, we support uh, our, our preferred authentication me mechanism is uh, is with TLS certificates, um, and we also support uh, password authentication uh, using the same uh, protocols as Postgres. Okay, cool. The other question was uh, the RAF protocol. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have anything on top of that for authentication verification? Um, so, so all uh, all connections between our uh, b between nodes in a cluster are secured by uh, m mutually authenticated TLS connections. Um, we don't have, uh, we, we don't have anything separate uh, on top of that for Raft specifically. Last, I guess maybe last one. Um, other than pprof, what other kind of debugging utilities, and either for performance or internals, were useful in the development of this system? Um, GoLang specific. Uh, let's see, I think uh, it can wait if if you want to table it. Uh, yeah, so uh, pprof was a big one. Um, we, we use uh, a distributed tracing tool called Lightstep, um, which was very uh, very helpful in pulling uh, pulling traces together from different uh, different nodes in the cluster and seeing uh, seeing where your time goes in a, in a distributed fashion. Um, we have uh, for the C plus plus portions of the uh, uh, of the system, we actually use JE malloc as our uh, memory allocator, um, specifically so that we can also use uh, pprof for that uh, memory tracking as well. Um, are you yeah, eventually going to be free of Seago? Uh, no, we're not. We're, not, we're, we're never going to be free of Seago. We uh, we use Seago uh, heavily in the uh, in the storage uh, storage layer to talk to RocksDB. Um, yeah, th th those are the uh, performance tools that come to mind. There are probably more, but. What, uh, what comes to mind now? 
Can I ask kind of a kind of a naive question? If I have, uh, say, I have a data center here in California, and I have uh, an um, an application that I'm backing with your database, and I want to improve performance uh, in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, is it as simple as uh, adding some nodes, a sufficient number of nodes to my cluster in my data center in Europe, and of course the surrounding uh, 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 um, compute servers, but if I did that, am I more than halfway there, or is there a lot more complexity that I'm missing at that level? So, so, the, so, so the problem with doing that is that once you uh, expand the, different, the distance between your, the servers in your cockroach cluster, then uh, your write performance gets worse because you have to cross that, uh, cross that distance um, for, every, for every write. Um, and so right now, so, so it's, it's going to kind of depend on the balance of reads versus writes in your, uh, in your application. But right now, it's generally going to be better for performance to, um, to keep, your, uh, keep your cockroach nodes you know, within uh, you know, 40, 60 milliseconds apart instead of trying to spread them across, uh, across continents like that. And then to improve, uh, improve performance globally with, uh, with caching at the, at the edges and, and that sort of thing. Uh, you mentioned write performance gets worse. Do you, uh, how do you implement reads? Are they local quorums, sort of um, just one? What, what, what's your? So, so right, right, now, um, right now, each, uh, each range has one, uh, one leader that serves all reads. And so in a geographically distributed cluster right now, your uh, read performance suffers as well because you have to, um, you know, for some fraction of the data, you have to go to a remote node for the, for the leader. Um, that's, uh, that's an area where we uh, are actively working to, uh, to improve things and let, uh, let more reads come from the followers. Um, may I ask, uh, why do you use uh, RocksDB as a storage format and uh, do you use that for rep replication or just for storage key value type of uh, store? Uh, yeah, we use, uh, we use RocksDB only for, uh, only for single node storage. It doesn't have any sort of replication layer uh, built in. Um, we uh, we use it because um, we had used uh, level DB on uh, on uh, other projects at a at a previous startup, and uh, and we, we generally liked it. Um, Rocks DB is uh, is a fork of level DB that is uh, tuned for higher performance in server situations, and so it's uh, it's pretty uh, pretty well suited to our uh, our use case here. Uh, two questions then. Bolt DB uh, and I'll, and query hints. Is that how you're planning on doing the stale reads through replicas? Um, sorry, yeah. Bolt DB. Um, sorry, is that Bolt DB with a with a B or yeah B, V yeah B O L T. Um, yeah, well, yeah. But then reading uh, when you want to read from from replicas, are you planning on doing that as query hints? I know that that's something the Postgres core community has largely eschewed in the past and and actively discouraged. But how are you planning on doing that? Um, as just a yeah. Uh, yeah, we, we haven't uh, we haven't decided how that's going to look at the uh, at the SQL level. Um, I think at least in our uh, in in our you know sketching out of the idea, we've been doing it with a uh, with a, a session variable, so that you can indicate uh, indicate a tolerance for uh, for you know re I want to read with uh, with no more than X milliseconds of staleness, things like that. The context you're using it. Uh, what pain points uh, did we come across with RocksDB? Um, I think um, I don't know. One uh, one uh, area uh, we've had to do some work with is uh, is in dealing with uh, with CGO and crossing the boundary from uh, between Go and C++ um, because uh, crossing that boundary is uh, is kind of expensive, and so we've had to uh, take some steps to minimize how often we uh, how often we uh, we cross over there. Um, I think um, th this isn't, uh, it, it's not, not, I mean, it's kind of a pain point. Um, it's something that we, get, you know, it's work that we, uh, that we know we need to do that we haven't, uh, haven't done yet, but it's that uh, we, we have uh, a lot of stuff in our system uh, acts kind of functionally like a log or like a write-ahead log when you're talking about the raft, uh, raft commands as they're being proposed. Um, and then we go and write those into RocksDB, which has its own write-ahead log. Um, and so th there are like multiple levels of write-ahead logging going on here, which is uh, which is suboptimal for performance, and uh, that's something that we uh, would like to, to fix at some point. Isn't that not just a factor of two, but a factor of n, which where, where n is the amount of uh, objects that you tend to uh, like one query of your database level, 
uh, we're going to write to our RocksDB n objects of a key value store. So it will um, be a total of n plus one log accesses. Uh, yeah, that, that that gets a little a little complicated because a lot of these uh, a lot of these log entries are very short lived and they don't get uh, they don't get compacted down into the lower levels of RocksDB. So um, you know, actually trying to do that math is uh, is tricky. But uh, yeah, th th there's multiple uh, multiple levels of, of accessing with the with the different logs and the uh, RocksDB SS tables. All right. Um, um, what? Uh, they uh, they will be um, we uh, <laughs> yeah we, we th this talk has been has been recorded and so we'll post the uh, post the video and the and the slides once uh, once that's done. All right, um, I think that uh, that's all the uh, all the uh, time we have for uh, for questions right now. I think but, um, thanks to everybody for uh, for coming out um, and. Uh, I'll be uh, we'll be sticking around a little bit uh, a little bit longer if you want to come and talk to talk to some of us uh, individually. Thank you, Ben.